Ginsburg, associate professor of biology and one of the principal investigators on the long-term ecological research project on the Prairie, and one of the primary researchers. So put that in the back, in your back pocket. If you have questions, he can answer them all. <laughs> Today, he has graciously joined us to talk about it. And you know, it's, it's, it's just a, a narrow, simple little topic of ecology and weather and climate. And so he's gonna hit it all in the space of, you don't have to, in the space of an hour and a half and two hours. We're gonna talk for probably about an hour, take a 15 minute break, let him finish up. We'll see how everyone's energy is doing. And then I told him, you know, we're gonna have to go outside. It's gonna be too nice today to, to more be outside. So we're gonna go outside and play a little bit. So. Wonderful stuff, good material. He's an expert on it, Dr. Jesse Mitchell. Wow. So, uh, I'm, Jesse Max. I'm a plant uh, ecophysiologist. So, um, I'm an ecologist, but most of my uh, research and emphasis is on like physiological processes of plants, so photosynthesis, water transport, you know, those kinds of things. So, um, I'm one of the plant ecologists who's not terribly good at identifying plants. So, like, if you walk around and ask me what some plant is, oh, no, I won't know. I mean, I know maybe 40, but given the tongue that has, like, 600 or so, that's not my forte. What I can tell you is I mean, a rough approximation of what the metabolic rate is of the plant or how much water is using or transpiration rates or, you know, things that are happening on a, on a more of a tissue-specific level. Species ID is not good. So today, though, I'm going to give you sort of a, a broad overview on the fuel of ecology, and then um, we'll take a break, and then um, Joe asked me to give a broad overview on climate. I'm not a climatologist, but um, as, my, as an ecophysiologist, a lot of what we do is put sensors out. So we are constantly putting out weather stations and, and sensors on the prairie to measure things like soil moisture the leaf temperature, wind speed, air temperature, soil temperature, the vapor pressure deficit, things like that. So we instrument everything. And as a byproduct of getting very interested in instrumentation, we've learned a lot about microclimate and some sort of basic climatological processes. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I don't like things to be terribly formal. That's like part of becoming an ecologist is you basically never have to dress up for the rest of your life. Um, but I also don't like to give very formal stuffy talks. So please stop me and ask questions as we go along. I would much rather stop and then answer questions and work through things as we go rather than wait till the end. So if you have any questions at all, please let, you know shout them out or raise your hand or whatever and let's, let's do it as we go. So, to start off, ecology is a fairly misunderstood term. So, can I have any feedback? What, what, what is ecology? If you're going to define this term, define this field, what is it? You can probably get 10 different answers from 10 different people. I know that if you ask the newspaper, you get a different answer than if you ask an academic. But what is ecology? The study of ecosystems and how the organisms in yeah, that's really close. Um, the, the ecosystem part, um, you can be an ecologist and study ecology independent of the ecosystem, but the organismal interactions is definitely key. Any, anything else? Any other thoughts? So, one, ecology is its own scientific discipline. Most of us tend to be biologists, but not all. Ecology is definitely interdisciplinary. Um, it incorporates a lot of the information from a lot of other scientific fields. Um, we incorporate a lot of genetics, evolution, from within biology. But ecologists oftentimes are dealing with physical principles. We're oftentimes dealing with fundamental chemical principles. We have a lot of physical science in the field, geology, soil science, biology. And then this idea of, of water, energy, nutrient cycling. But one thing that ecology isn't is synonymous with environmentalism. A lot of times you'll see, you'll hear the word saying, well, I believe in ecological living. I have no idea what the hell that means. But ecology and environmentalism are not the same thing. 
Now, an ecologist can have an environmental mindset. That's fine. An environmentalist can study ecology, but the two words don't mean the same thing. An environmentalist has an objective, and an ecologist is a scientist who is trying to understand the process. And so the two things can be related, but they're not the same term. In ecology, basically what we're trying to do is understand how natural systems operate, and we want to be able to predict their responses to change, like natural change, natural cycling, natural population change, or it can be human-induced change. But that's what we do in ecology. We want to understand the system and predict. So, my definition of ecology is a study of the interactions between organisms and their environment. But this can take place at a variety of scales, and the environment can be composed of many different things. So we have the abiotic components of the environment. We have things like water, light, heat, nutrient, soil. All of these things are sort of changing through time and space. And then we have the living components of the environment. And the combination of these biotic and abiotic um, components, basically, and the interactions with the organisms that live there, that's basically the primary tendency. So you can think of ecology and the, the people who work in, in, who are ecologists who work in the field, you can think of them as spanning this sort of hierarchy of scales. So I tend to work on this level, on the organismic scale. I mostly work on grasses. I spend a lot of time looking at, at dogwood encroachment here on site and trying to understand what it is about dogwood that's allowing it to encroach. Then you can move up to, to different scales. So go from organisms to populations, populations of species, communities of different interacting species on the site, the ecosystems, so the progress furry, biomes, and ultimately the biosphere. So going across the scales. So this ecological hierarchy, um, within each one of these, or across all these disciplines, you can ask questions about how organisms are inter interacting with their environment. So I'm referring to amount of water availability. So here in the music grasslands, we tend to get more precipitation um, annually, long term, then we lose to evaporation and transpiration. So the amount of water that comes into the system is greater than the water that's lost. And so that's one of the things that's characteristic. And we're on the western edge of this. We get roughly 850 millimeters of rain a year here, and that exceeds the long term evaporation rate. So we get more rain historically than we lose through evapotranspiration. That's what makes it a music grassland. Then as you go further west, and you get to the mixed grass prairie, the short grass prairie, and then the semi-arid desert grasslands down in Arizona and New Mexico, the, it's a deficit. You basically are getting less rainfall than you're losing per year. And so we're called a music grassland based on moisture. Would you mind spelling it, please? Music, M-E-S-I-C. M-E-S-I-C. Thank you. These are great questions. Anything else? Okay, so for the rest of this talk um, on ecology, basically from this hierarchy, I'm only going to focus on two different components. I mean, so ecology is taught to the undergrads at K-State. It's a three-credit hour class for an entire semester, and I'm not sure they can even pack it all into that. And then I've basically got 45 minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> just cram through this really fast. And so um, we're going to gloss over a lot of concepts. However, and for the rest of the talk today on ecology, I'm basically going to focus on some principles that apply to population and some principles that apply to ecosystems. So we'll start off with population. So the definition of population is all the individuals of a given species that are occurring in the same area and are capable of interbreeding. So we're referring to a population of similar individuals within a given species. Populations are a unit of ecological and evolutionary study, just like we had on that last slide. And one of the key things here is they represent a common gene pool. And that common gene pool, though, has the potential for change through time. So the mechanism of that change through time is the process of natural selection. Natural selection is acting at the level of an individual, but it causes changes through time at the level of the population. So the process of evolution does not happen within the course of a lifetime of an individual or even a few individuals. 
evolution happens through, changes through time, acting upon the population. But the key things for the mechanism of, of evolution is long periods of time, for the most part, are many generations of individuals within a population, and there's an inherent component of time. That time could be short if individuals live very quickly, but typically for most organisms, that's a long period. The study of population genetics is a study of changes in gene pools over time, and this has given rise to the field of evolutionary ecology. So most evolutionary ecologists basically are focused on changes in traits associated with populations. So that's how evolutionary ecology can be linked to ecology by studying, studying changes within populations. So why should you care about changes in population? Well, one is from an evolutionary perspective. Another one is for management and conservation purposes. A lot of times we're interested in understanding how we can conserve populations upon a landscape, especially threatened populations, ones that have reached low numbers or might be imperiled in some way or the other. And another is just for to understand our own species, understanding how we're utilizing resources across the entire body. So understanding human population dynamics. So some key questions for understanding populations is, is the overall population size growing or declining, or is it stable? Like, how's the actual overall population size changing? What's that rate of change? What are the controls on these processes? And can we reasonably predict them? One of the things that's interesting in the study of population ecology and the study of populations in general is mathematical models typically do a really nice job of forecasting change. And I'll show you a couple of examples of this later on, but population ecology is a, um, is a field in that the application of several discrete model types are very effective predictors of change. And if you get back to, if you remember to one of the things I said originally, ecologists want to be able to predict changes. And so in population ecology, this, this is, well, I don't want to say easy, but it is um, amenable to many different types of popular mathematical models. Okay, so if you want to understand changes in populations, there's certain terms that you have to be able to uh, have a feeling for what they mean. And so some of the things that we'll discuss a little bit are growth rates, limiting factors, in this case of more, more typically refers to resources, mortality and survival, the age structure, and then some demography of the population, so percent female, percent male. So there's a few other terms that I want to define before we can continue. One of them is the overall population size. So you have to have a be able to estimate and measure the population size of the that you're working at. That tends to be referred to by an uppercase letter N. So the letter of that uppercase N refers to the overall population size. And then you have to be able to like basically describe the rate of change through time. And that rate is generally lowercase r, and that refers to the population growth rate. So how many new individuals does each current individual produce? So it's a rate of change. So that rate of change, population growth rate, you can think of it as basically being driven by births and deaths. So you can have a per capita birth rate and a per capita death rate. And the difference between these two, births minus deaths, going to give you your overall population growth rate, so R. So very, very easy. If births are less than deaths, you have a declining rate. If, uh, if deaths are lower than births, then you have a positive population growth rate. Pretty simple study. Does all of this, does all of this apply to plants the same way as it does to, when I think of births and deaths, I'm thinking of like animals and mm -hmm. animals, but I think Use the same terms to talk about plants and individual plants, or, yeah. or is that? You absolutely do, it, but it gets complicated. Can you think of one thing? One? Can you think of one characteristic of plants, especially like plants in our environment, that might complicate the whole birth and death thing? And a lot of Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> A lot of our plant species are clonal, and so they're asexual. So a lot of the recruitment element of tall grass prairie doesn't come from seeds. There's been quite a bit of research on this. Uh, 
uh, David Hartnett in our in um, biology at Kate State has, has shown that 99% of the plant individuals on the landscape didn't come from seeds. I mean, they would have originally, but on an annual year, if you're talking about the rate of change, recruitment in our ecosystem is colonial. It's asexual. They're sending out asexual plants. So we produce all these seeds. All the grasses grow and go into flower in the fall. And very little of that seed actually ever germinates and becomes new individuals. It's outcompeted. And so most it's a clonal landscape. So that complicates this idea of birth and death. If birth is essentially the production basically of a new tiller and not potentially a new genetic individual. And death, if you don't necessarily ever die because you just sent up a new genetic individual and you're basically migrating across the landscape as a plant. Now, we are really muddying up our ability to talk about populations here. So, well, that is a really good question. So I'll go back to this in a minute, but it's something that I like to think about. I'm not a population ecologist, but the apartment is. And they've studied this a lot here on the prairie, the role of vegetative or asexual recruitment of plants versus sexual recruitment of plants. And in our ecosystem, it's overwhelmingly dominated by asexual recruitment. So something that's kind of interesting. You see these big seed years. A very little, very low percent of those seeds ever turns into a new individual. That makes, <clears throat> excuse me, that makes the consumers of the seeds even better off then. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. But there, that recruitment of new genetic individuals by a seed isn't because they're all being consumed. I mean, plants produce an overwhelming number of seeds. It has more to do with space in the soil. You know, yeah. there's the, the, the location for new seeds to basically colonize habitat, gain resources, and outcompete their neighbors is slim. So while some of these might germinate, they don't live very long. There's not the space for them. When you're talking about uh, cloning individuals, are you talking about grasses more so, or also wildflowers like milkweed and Yeah, so the grasses are, are clonal. Um, some of the forbs are also clonal. Not all the grasses that we have, but the majority. Our, mm -hmm. our, our warm season grasses that are right. in this ecosystem are all, are sure. all asexual. Um, some of the forbs are, but a lot of them are not. So yeah. my broad statements about recruitment, 99%, are mostly referring to the grasses. Okay. You know. the, the other very distinct and obvious organism in our system that is highly clonal is roughly dogwood and smoosumin. So those, those dogwood islands that you see on the landscape in frequently burned locations, that's one genetic individual. So you basically had the recruitment of one individual seed, and then that mother is sending out her asexual clones. And they're all interlinked. And in fact, well, we are way off topic. <laughs> this, this is way more interesting to me than, than my dry talk about um, So with dogwood on the landscape, it is clonal, and it's acting as one functional organism. So it looks like, oh my gosh, look at all these individual dogwood in. No, that's one organism. And what she's doing is she pulls up water from deep within the center of that island, and then she moves it through rhizomes out to the periphery. If you go out and you sever the rhizome, ry the, you know what a rhizome is? everyone know what a rhizome is? It's a below ground lateral stem. You know, so it's a stem, but it's lateral and below ground too. So she'll pull up the water, move it through those lateral stems to the clones. And if you sever it and pull it up, they don't grow roots. So on the periphery of the dogwood islands, those stems don't even have roots. They just have a rhizome. So they're getting all of their water from the center. Is a sumac the same way? Yeah. Yeah. So if you could find the center. So as they grow, as they grow bigger and bigger and bigger, um, new clones right in the center will all send down their will all send down deep tap roots, and so um, it's not as if there's just one central tap root. There is at the beginning, but as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, then they will go down. And then of course, as the dogwood gets larger and larger and larger, its leaf area gets higher and higher and higher, and it shades out the grasses. If you go inside of there, there's very little grass. And their dogwood leaves are very, they decompose very fast. And so there's very little fuel. So that's how they become fire resistant through time, is they shade out the grass so there's no fuel for fire, and their own leaves decompose fast enough 
that if you run a fire in there in the spring, there's really no fuel for the fire to carry. So, who we? We are way off topic. But um, it's fine. these are all good questions. So, to get back though to the original question of does this apply to plants? Absolutely. But I'm not going to go into it, but the, the estimation of births and deaths becomes much more complicated when you have recruitment by a sexual reproduction and recruitment by an asexual reproduction. But it can be done and it totally applies. Okay, we're going to be talking about fire ecology next week, but let's let's feed into this. Yeah. Okay, let, let's go back to the dogwood islands and the sumac. How do you get rid of it? It doesn't have any fuel for fire, you, so how does one get rid of them? So that's a so that's a big active study right now. So we we don't know, but um, our best guess right now would be to, well, so you can go in and cut it out and put tort on each stem, on each stem, blah, blah, blah. So you can physically remove it, but you, that is completely impractical across an entire landscape. And then there are, you know, there's pros and cons of using the tort on But, um, so physically it could potentially be removed. Another way, though, that we're, we're thinking about the management of dogwood is um, using fire but potentially using fire at different times of year, and more specifically, using fire during periods of time when physiologically the island might be already a little bit stressed. So you could imagine that following a drought, so remember in 2012 we had the big drought, dogwood wasn't affected at all. We had low growth in the grasses and everything else. Dogwood produced the same amount of biomass that it always does. It didn't alter its leaf level physiology, even though we were in a record drought. Dogwood was fairly resistant to the 2012 drought. However, this superficially resistant. However, its carbohydrate reserves were down and its ability to basically withstand damage from fire was low. When we burned in the spring of 13, we saw the biggest dieback on dogwood we'd ever seen. So potentially burning during periods of time when it's already stressed might basically impede its ability to regrow. You'll, it'll lose enough of its carbohydrates such that it can't grow new stems. It doesn't have enough stored energy to make new stems anymore. Um, so one of the things we're doing is going to be we're initiating this spring a new rain out experiment out on site that will be um, down on 4A and, and uh, R1A in the far southwestern corner of the site. We're going to build a big, large, like ramp-like shelter, the rain out shelter for the Dogwood Islands and start stressing them with, you know, making an artificial drought that stresses them, and then looking at the recovery of the fire based on stressed and non-stressed islands. So fire will probably be key, but using fire in a time period where it will have a bigger impact on the, on the organism. A couple of years ago, uh, helping with the burns, I noticed, I don't know whether it was you or another researcher, was putting bales of hay into the dogwood islands to give it more fuel to burn. Is that one way that they are trying to get rid of dogwood? Uh, yeah, that was a master's student who worked with John Briggs at the time. Okay. And you're exactly right. He was trying to increase the fuel level to increase the, the, the temperature and the, the potential lethal impacts of the fire on the island. Um, I don't remember all of the results of that study. And they had sensors in there too, so they could make, measure the temperature of the fire based on adding the fuel amounts. I don't remember all of the results of that. They did, of course, have the hotter the temperature, the more negative the impact it was on the island. But the bottom line was, is because they're recruiting new stems from below ground, and the impacts of fire only permeate the soil a very small amount. It, it didn't. It wasn't. It didn't kill the organism. It, it wasn't effective, essentially. No. I mean, it, it was effective at, at greater mortality of the above ground stems, but it wasn't effective um, for. So, so did it produce more Yeah, so growth? it responded with more stems in a wider, wider periphery. <laughs> However, you know, it's not, that's not an effective, I mean, could you imagine like walking around and trying to throw fuel into every item? You might as well just cut that stuff right. down. So, I mean, that, that's not really an effective means. Okay. What were we talking about? Okay, population growth rates. So how organisms change over time. So here's an example of what I meant. We have a population of 1,000 individuals, 400 births and 250 deaths. 
So this is a really simple problem. We can figure out what the, what the population growth rate is going to be. The birth rate is going to be 0.4 births per individual per year, so 400 over 1,000. The death rate is going to be 0.25 deaths per individual per year, so 250 over 1,000. And remember that rate was just births minus deaths. So the per capita growth rate is basically going to be 0.15 new individuals per individual year. So this is a good example of how you would calculate that R, that lowercase r, the rate. Now I said that in, um, in, in ecology, especially, especially in population ecology, we can fit mathematical models to basically define and, and show different rates of population change through time. Two of the most common are a, an exponential model, so an exponential growth rate, or a logistic growth rate. So I'll show you some of the patterns of, of both of these. So patterns of population growth, um, these two different model types, and then how well do they describe growth in natural populations? So we might think about which types of populations might exhibit exponential growth and which types of populations, like what type of organism or what type of species might exhibit logistic growth, so the two of these. And then ultimately, can we link this back to natural selection? How do rates of population change, how are they influenced by natural selection? So the first is exponential population growth. So this is what that curve would look like. We have some change through time, and you can see you have a rapidly increasing population size. And so um, we have down here a new term here, G, so population growth per unit time. So population growth per unit time is a function of the rate there are that we just talked about, births minus deaths, minus the population the population size. So, G would equal R minus N. So when we have an exponential population growth right here, I have the question, under what conditions would this occur? Can you think of a species or an organism or an environment that would exhibit exponential population growth? Bacteria? Yeah, bacteria is a good one. Any others? Sometimes in aquatic communities, like algae can experience exponential population growth if, if resources are present. Um, Rope, go ahead. Oh. Aphids colonizing a plant initially? Yeah, absolutely. That's good. So there's lots of, there's, there's others too, but these are all fantastic yeah, examples. These are all examples of populations within species that basically can go from very small population size to very large population size in a very short period of time. That's exponential population, exponential population growth. Cool. Um, I talked about it again, but I have it in here. Does, it, does everyone remember what R was? It was the rate, right? The rate of change, and the rate of population growth, and that was just births minus deaths. Exponential population growth, can this be sustained long term? No. No. Eventually, this population will crash. How does this relate to natural selection? Dr. Cobor? <laughs> So, exponential population growth. When the population is in this rate of exponential change here, is there a lot of pressure on traits which regulate the individual's ability to reproduce? Or is everybody reproducing at maximal potential when they're in this portion of the curve? It's the latter, right? All individuals are reproducing at maximum potential. We have exponential population growth. So in this case, if I understand this correctly, natural selection would not be playing a large role in selecting traits that are limiting that population. Um, but if you're increasing the population, wouldn't there be more pressure because there's, becoming, there's less resources available, so wouldn't there be more pressure to look okay. At some point in time, in this period though, basically resources are non-limiting. That's why it's going blah, 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 blah. But then right this idea, can this kind of growth be sustained? Eventually, resources will run out. And then you're exactly right. And then at that point in time, now you've reached a new system <laughs> and you're no longer basically, then we're, then we're thinking about this in a different way. But as we have it expressed right here, and this basically resources are not limited. That's why the population can just grow and grow and grow. That's exponential population. Could you say that the human population is following this trend? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that in a little bit. But yes. We are currently exhibiting exponential <laughs> population. 
So another type of growth that's common in ecological communities is logistic population. And this one inherently includes basically resource availability, which sets up basically a cap on how big that population can grow. In logistic population growth, you have a population size over time. You're going to have a rate of change. And basically, you reach an asymptote where that rate of change in population growth doesn't get any larger. And at this point in time, you tend to refer to that, that sort of plateau or asymptote at, by using the symbol K. So does anyone know what K represents? Oh, no. Yeah. Carrying capacity. Carrying capacity, that's exactly right. So you reach carrying capacity. So in logistic population growth, this, and that's a key difference between exponential population growth and, and uh, logistic population growth. In logistic population growth, you reach a carrying capacity. The ecosystem or the region or the community cannot basically support any more individuals. So there's no longer a change in the, the number of individuals that are existing in that ecosystem because it cannot support it. So you've reached a carrying capacity. So as n population size gets closer and closer uh, to k, what happens? Well, that rate of change goes down. The recruitment of new individuals into the population becomes smaller. So in this case, what does, what does logistic population growth say about resource availability? When we were talking about exponentials, if we don't have to worry, you assume resources are completely prevalent. It's not limiting growth at all. But in this situation, what is this? What does the shape of this curve tell you about resource development? It's, is it just enough to sustain the growth? No. Resources become limited, and then that so that limits or it, it creates a ceiling on the overall population growth that basically can occur. <clears throat> and then this is can be related to natural selection because then individuals that are are more suited for their environment or have traits that allow them to basically reproduce more than their neighbors, those traits can then be passed down through generations and through a long period of time. You could have a change in, in, um, in the genes that are present within the population based on reproductive potential, based on the availability of resources. So uh, a nice sort of analogy that compares humans to this and these two different model types between logistic and exponential population growth um, deals with, there was a convention in, uh, I believe it was in Germany, around 1890. And at that period of time, basically starvation was a big threat for Europe and for large portions of the globe. And the great minds of the time, they were mostly chemists and physicists, basically got together to talk about, we as a species are you know, threatened with starvation globally. Like, what can we do about this? And at that point in time, all of agriculture was supported either by animal waste for fertilizer or the mining of saltpeter in, in Chile. So this uh, um, caliche that forms in the deserts of Chile would get loaded onto ships, and then those ships basically would carry it to Europe, and they would use it to fertilize their field. But they'd reached, they'd reached their carrying capacity on how much food could be produced in agricultural systems. And because they'd reached this carrying capacity, human population growth on the planet was fixed. We already were threatened with massive starvation. And it was this meeting that basically gave the impetus to everybody to find a way to artificially produce fertilizers and nitrogen inputs that can be added into the soil. And it was at that meeting that Fritz Haber basically got the idea that he wanted to solve this problem. And then Haber, who was a German, um, basically was the one who in his laboratory devised the mechanism to take atmospheric nitrogen from the air and basically find a way with the right catalyst, high temperature and high pressure, to make ammonia. And then as he was able to synthesize nitrogen, he basically cracked the code of how to, it was the dawn of the agricultural revolution. He was the one, he won a Nobel Prize for it. And then he, working with Carl Bosch, um, who was the engineer, Bosch figured out a way to basically produce nitrogen on a large scale using Haber's technique and then the agricultural revolution was on. So we as humans went from having reached our carrying capacity, and we had our, our species and our population had logistic population growth, and now we have exponential population growth, and we have a birth event for it. For better or for worse. <laughs> 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 but 
basically, as we learned how to fertilize ecosystems, we are able to remove K, and then that changed the shape of this curve for us. Okay, so, so some of the things that limit population growth through time that can be density dependent. So density dependent limiting factors are what affects individuals depending upon the abundance of individuals across the landscape. Density dependent factors that limit population growth can be disease, predation, searching for food, anything that changes that birth minus death rate. Density independent limiting factors um, basically can be things that impact all individuals regardless of their fitness or genes, etc. So those kind of things can just be, um, you can kind of think of them as being a little bit more stochastic, like weather events and fire. And then this gets at how human population grows. So if you go look at the history of humans, we had few points in time, you can draw this back further, where as a species we nearly went extinct. But we exhibited very flat population growth for a very long period of time. And as we start to get more and more modern, we went up. And then it was, you know, as we start to reach about a billion individuals, that we reached that carrying capacity, and then the dawn of the agricultural revolution. And now this graph is out of date. We're already over 70 billion individuals. So if you look at this curve and you look at our other curves, that's called exponential population growth. And so you can then apply some of the statistics that you can get online to actually basically start to estimate some of these principles we were just talking about. The, the letter R, the population size, and then understand aspects of how some of these ecological principles also apply to human change. One of the things that, uh, so there was a couple things that I specifically wanted to point out. So right now we're over 7 billion people. The current rate of human population growth is 1.13%. So that would be that letter R value that we were talking about uh, earlier. So then you can think about how many new people are born per year. So we're adding 79 million individuals per year. 216,000 people are born every day. It doesn't make your birthday seem so special. 216,000 people have the same birthday. But then you can start to think about doubling time based on these rates of change. Of course, it implies that 1.13% will stay fairly constant. But given that, in 62 years, we'll basically have doubled the population. We'll be at 14 billion. So you can then start to understand how things change through time and make predictions. Because as ecologists, we want to predict them. And then you can start to think about more theoretical questions. Is this sustainable? Where will our K be? Where will our new carrying capacity be? Right? It's a little bit unclear. I'm not sure. The Earth is... We, we're an ingenious species. We are very good at adapting, finding, inventing new ways, engineering solutions to problems. So who knows? We might be able to sustain 14 billion people. And the answer to this is completely rhetorical. No, nope, I don't have a clue what the carrying capacity of the Earth is. We are a very ingenious species. But 14 billion is a pretty big number. OK, that's it for populations. So now we'll go on. And go on to the second part of this. I'll try to go a little faster. This is something I know more about because ecophysiologists also tend to work at the ecosystem scale. So this is a little bit more in tune with what my research is. So ecosystems. When you think of ecosystems, you tend to think of all the living organisms that give in, live in a given area, as well as the abiotic conditions that are inherent to that area. So the microclimate that exists there, the soils, the nutrient availability, carbon availability. So ecosystem is more in, or a more all-encompassing, uh, including both uh, the, the biotic and abiotic components over a large portion of the landscape. So it includes basically everything. Ecosystem ecologists though, tend to study things like nutrient cycling, um, water cycling, carbon cycling, things like that. So like I mentioned, ecosystems are the biotic and abiotic components. They're thermodynamically open. Any, anyone want to speculate what I mean by that? I, I wrote on there, they require continual energy flows to function, which oh, that's kind of a terrible definition. So like, what does thermodynamically open mean? So when you think about energy into an ecosystem, does the energy within the ecosystem cycle, or is it a one-way arrow? It cycles. Oh, no, no, no. no? A one way arrow. So energy energy oh, is, oh, yeah. is basically when you think about 
the energy in our universe, energy is unidirectional. It starts at the sun and then it flows out into basically into and becomes entropy. And this is one of the basically three principles of thermodynamics. So there's three laws of thermodynamics that basically are postulated in nothing. They're laws. They're not going to change. And the first law of thermodynamics is... Energy cannot be created or destroyed. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. All of the energy that is was here at the Big Bang and will be here until our energy or our solar system and universe collapses back upon itself. Energy is a constant. It can neither be created nor destroyed. Second law of thermodynamics? Watch out. I can answer them all. It's and a one-way street. The disorder of the system is continually increasing. The second law of thermodynamics is depressing. It is basically <laughs> you cannot win. Entropy wins. Disorder will ultimately win. We are going from perfect order at the immediate beginning of the, of the Big Bang and the dawn of our universe to eventually chaos and disorder. Well, there will not be structured systems. What was great about life, though, is we are like, you know, the thumb and the nose of entropy. <laughs> because look how ordered we are. Our little systems, you know, basically can walk around and plants are doing their thing. But eventually, we go back to dust and entropy wins. But for that slight period of time, you know, we're thumbing our nose at entropy. So the second law of thermodynamics is basically one that talks about that energy is a one-way street going from perfect order, or in the case of our solar system, very high energy in the sun, the rays and the heat come out of the sun, and it eventually spreads out through the universe and goes to disorder. That's the second law of thermodynamics. The third law of thermodynamics, anyone? This one has almost no application, but it's important. The third law of thermodynamics is there's one caveat to order, and that's at a perfect crystal and absolute zero. That's the only time when the molecular bonds basically have no resonance, and because it's at absolute zero, there's no energy in the system, and because it's a perfect crystal and all the molecules are lined up in absolute symmetry, that's the one time when entropy doesn't work. So that has absolutely no applications in ecosystems. But the second law does, and so we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. So ecosystems, though, have biotic structure. We have food webs and trophic levels. We'll talk about that in a little bit. You can, however, recycle materials. So energy is one way, but water and nutrients cycle, carbon cycles. So we have a cycling of, we do have cycles within ecosystems, but energy is a one-way street. So why should we care about ecosystem ecology? It provides a mechanistic basis for understanding changes in our biosphere. Ecosystems provide important services. They provide goods and services to humans, and so it's it's, it's imperative to understand ecosystems and ecosystem ecology. We are altering our ecosystems, so it's, inherent, it's an inherently important to understand ecosystems in terms of how they process um, from a first principles approach, but also how our modifications are changing how ecosystems operate. Many global environmental problems are, are linked to changes in ecosystem function. The same ecosystem functions like food, water availability, shelter, um, disease prevention, things like that. So as we change our environment and we change ecosystems, we change the functions and the services that these ecosystems provide. So here's a few examples of some of those ecosystem services. Purification of air and water, detox of waste, the regulation of climate. Um, I'll talk about this briefly when we get to climate, if we get to climate. But uh, ecosystems, climate is not a one-way arrow. We think about the climate is, impacts the system in the ecosystem, but the ecosystem does not actually impact the climate, and that's, that's not right. The ecosystems have huge impacts on both determining and modifying the climate of the, of the, of the region in which they're in. And then finally, one of the key ecosystem services is the production and maintenance of biodiversity. Biodiverse communities tend to be more stable through time, more resistant to change, and more resilient to change. Biodiversity plays an important role. Okay, so when we think about how things change in an environment, energy flows through ecosystems. It's a one-way arrow. Nutrients tend to be recycled. So when we think about energy, we have our solar energy. It can basically be captured by the producers. The producers, of course, are the plants. So producers capture solar energy. 
then the organisms that consume the producers pass that energy on, and then ultimately the decomposers recycle the consumers and the producers, and then the decomposers actually then, ultimately the last, the final, final bit is just the recycling of respiration, so carbon dioxide, and the low energy that's associated with carbon dioxide. But material inputs, when you think about organic nutrients being converted into inorganic nutrients and recycling, if this was just nitrogen, nitrogen tied up in plant biomass, nitrogen that would still be organic in the microbial community in the soil as it gets decomposed. But then that nitrogen gets converted into inorganic, inorganic sources which the plants can use, and then it's taken back up. So I have nutrients there, but you could think of it as nitrogen or phosphorus or other important nutrients in the system. But the nutrient cycle, that energy flows through a system. Energy is one way. Energy cannot be stored, basically. That's the second law of thermodynamics. You cannot store energy. That's why it's a one-way system, one-way here. So when we think about food chains, this is an important component of ecosystem ecology. So we have different trophic levels. <coughs> so uh, grasses are plants. So grass is my example here. A lot of times you'll hear it referred to as an autotroph, meaning they're self-feeding. Or a producer, it's the same thing. So these are two synonymous terms for basically the first level, the trophic, trophic, first trophic level. And you can have the primary consumer of an organism that's going to eat the producer. So in this case, you've got a grasshopper. It could be called a heterotroph, herbivore. Sparrow would also be a heterotroph because it's consuming another organism. But then in this case, because the sparrow was consuming the grasshopper, it would be a secondary consumer. A tertiary consumer would be the spot of the, the hawk that consumes the sparrow. And then if the fox was eating the hawk or the sparrow, then it might be the alternate consumer. So these are all sort of synonymous terms. This is, I'm sure, not new information to anyone. Other trophic levels, though, that you can have would be an omnivore that might be feeding at multiple portions of the trophic level. So imagine if we had still had our grizzlies here in Kansas. You know, they could be basically serving uh, or operating as a primary consumer as, a, as well as at the top of the trophic level. So omnivore, operating at multiple levels. And then that detritivore would be a recycler in the soil. So something that's feeding on dead material. It's a few dead plant. So how many links can you have in a food chain? So um, in here outside in, in our tall grass prairie, how many total links do you think you can get? How many of these links? We got up to four on this slide. How many do you think we we have here locally? Isn't that it? Or might be a good guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that we tend to get more than four in most terrestrial environments. Um, yeah, somewhere up to the third or fourth. So if you were in the if you were in the savannas in in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, you know the top predators like the cats or whatever might be operating on about that third, potentially fourth trophic level. If you add the coyote on top of the fox, you could go to five. <laughs> yeah. But the coyote oftentimes, though, will eat things that are at lower as the trophic level. Yeah, but if there's a fox in his territory, if you catch him, he will eat. There you go. What about the aquatic communities? Do you think aquatic communities have fewer trophic levels or more trophic levels than terrestrial systems? A lot more. Typically, with aquatic communities, you can get somewhere up to even seven different trophic levels. So aquatic communities tend to be able to support more trophic levels than terrestrial communities. So you can kind of think about what are some of the rules, though, for energy that gets passed up from one trophic level to the next. So the source of all of our energy is the sun. Radiation is produced by um, the conversion of hydrogen into helium. Basically gets radiated through our solar system. We capture some of that, or autotrophs do. And then each time you have a change in the trophic level, there's a reduction in the amount of energy that gets passed from one trophic level to the next. So if you start down here in the plant community and you go up, you kind of have those changes. Does anyone want to speculate what that what percentage of that energy that gets passed across trophic levels is? Do you think it's good? Is there a lot of conservation of energy? 
or is it bad? We're not very efficient at converting energy from one form to another. 10%? Yeah, it's low. 10% it, is basically the agreed upon estimate for what that is. That's really close, yeah. So basically 10% of the energy gets passed. So it doesn't take very long to go from the energy that would be associated with carbohydrates in the grasses to get consumed by the primary consumer and then each time you go up the trough level, it's another reduction of 10% of the energy each time you change cooking. Okay, so energy is not conserved as you go up. And this, again, gets back to thermodynamics. So we had the first law that energy is neither created nor destroyed. So energy comes in many different forms, light, heat, chemical energy, electrical energy. But for the most part, the energy that we have that sustains ecosystems is coming from the sun in the form of light. But then, but then there's still energy in some of these other forms. But for the living components, basically, it's all coming from the sun. Then the second law of thermodynamics, like I said, is that with basically energy cannot be conserved. Each time you trans have a transformation, you lose energy out of the system. You can't store energy. You can't store energy because entropy or disorder always works. And so you go from the source of all of our energy being solar, it's produced as heat, and most all of the solar energy produced is lost as heat to the solar system, and a very small fraction of that solar energy actually gets incorporated or absorbed by plants, actually reaches plant leaves. So very little of the actual output and light energy that hits the earth actually is captured by leaves of plants. And every single time you change a trophic level from plant to animal, animal to animal to animal to animal, and ultimately decomposer, 10, you know, you're only passing on 10% of what was there previously. It's a reduction of energy in each step. So this is the same concept, this 10% rule. Each time you change trophic level, you change, um, there's, a, there's a large reduction in energy that is passed. All right. Let's talk a little bit about plants, and then I'll try and get this ecology portion wrapped up. Then we'll take a little break, and then we will um, come back and talk a little bit about climate. I study plants. I teach plant physiology at the university. I think I've talked about photosynthesis in six one-hour lectures, and I'm not really sure I'm giving it justice. And now I'm basically going to put up one slide with photosynthesis. <laughs> you know, so it's a little more complicated than this. But if you distill down photosynthesis, basically you're taking a very low energy carbon substrate, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, there's very little energy associated with this molecule. It's, it is not a very reactive molecule. So you're taking a low energy, low energy um, substrate, adding water, and then with light through photosynthesis, you're producing simple sugar. So you're going from basically low energy carbon to high energy carbon. And as a byproduct of this process, water gets split in the light reactions. And as that water gets cleaved in light reactions, oxygen is produced as a well. byproduct. That's photosynthesis very simply. You're going from low energy carbon to high energy carbon. Basically, plants basically are feeding themselves. They're doing the impossible. They're, they're reducing carbon. And so um, in this process, though, it sets off the ability for ecosystems to function. But this, this Simple sugar here actually then forms the backbone for all complex sugars, starches, and then ultimately the really complex proteins and fats and everything else that are going to be synthesized by heterotrophs that they can consume plants. Respiration, you'll notice photosynthesis and respiration are inherently linked because respiration is just the opposite of photosynthesis. If you look at these two equations here, Photosynthesis is CO2 in water, basically produces a simple sugar and oxygen. Respiration is just the opposite. You're taking your simple sugar and using oxygen, and you're producing carbon dioxide, water, and energy. This thing, though, is important. This energy part right here, what is that energy? What allows me to stand up here and walk around and talk to you and everything else? I'm like blowing out energy as I'm sitting up here. You're doing nothing except running the brain, and that's producing tons of energy. So what is this energy that is produced in your cells as a byproduct of respiration? ATP. ATP. That's not my answer. Heat is, heat is entropy. Heat is unharnessable energy. We are producing a lot of heat, but we can't use heat. Living, living organisms can't use heat. 
is ATP. So our cells produce ATP. ATP is basically the energy that is produced as we basically respire sugar. And ATP is what allows our cells to do everything. Plants use ATP. So a common misnomer is that I hear is animals respire, plants photosynthesize. Well, well, we do respire and we don't photosynthesize, but plants respire too. Plants respire 24 hours a day. Plant cells have to respire because plant cells need ATP. All living organisms need ATP. So while we, we stink and we can't do photosynthesis, we just respire. Plants do both. They photosynthesize during the day, they respire during the night, and they respire during the day. Plants respire 24 hours a day just like we do. And they have to respire because living organisms need energy and we get it from basically the sugars. Plants get it from the sugars that they make. Animals get it from the sugars that they consume, either from other animals or from plants. Okay, a few more slides talk about how energy flows and nutrient cycles. So this is sort of a primary concept that I hope you get by the end of the day. What is ATP? Uh, <laughs> adenosine, adenosine, adenosine triphosphate. triphosphate. <laughs> it is, <laughs> All right, everybody knows it better than me. <laughs> uh, it is just the molecular currency. Of the, it's a form of chemical energy. Yeah, it's a chemical energy that's produced in the cell. But it's used to do everything. It's, it's used to make, uh, it's used to repair the cell. It's used to produce, um, you know, new cells. ATP is used for everything. What would you call perspiration and the discharge of that ATP? Yeah, yeah, that's... That's exactly right. Respiration is the process. Uh, is a, This is an oxidation reaction where energy is released. And that energy is released as the molecular bonds of this sugar are basically oxidized. So you're going from a carbon compound that's high in energy, has, has molecular bonds that are energy rich. And as these bonds get broken into a low energy carbon, this energy is released. And that's the process of respiration. A few minutes ago, I understood you to say something to the effect of energy cannot be stored. I wrote down to ask you later, in what sense is ATP not a storage of energy? It's a good question. ATP. A ATP is, um, is converted to ADP, which is a lower form of the same molecule, but so the reduction of that energy though is lost. So you can think of that energy as being partially conserved between ATP and ADP through time. But all of the energy that was produced, so you can imagine the energy was, that was in this, if you, if you took like a calorometer and you were able to calculate the total number of calories, you know, of heat that could be potentially produced by one molecule of glucose, right? So you can look at this, so chemically, you can think of the potential energy to develop the, um, that could be produced by one molecule of glucose. Like from a chemistry perspective, total amount of energy in one molecule. That total amount of energy does not make it over to here. Energy is lost in this process of respiration. It's imperfect. That's the second law of thermodynamics. So every time this happens, it's pretty conserved. It gets close, but that's the second law. Every time you have any kind of chemical conversion, any time anything takes place, some of the energy gets lost. So all of the energy then cannot be stored. Yeah, that's fine. And if you take the long view, it will eventually all be lost. Because eventually this planet will go away and others will too. And then there is no energy. But that's the pretty long view. That's the like billions of years long view. Does that help the question at all? Maybe I should have phrased it a little different. Not all. Okay, I gotta speed this up. I'm not killing you guys. All right. uh, so energy flows, nutrient cycle. That's. I know that in the 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 documentation that Jill provides for this class, one of the principles of, of understanding ecosystems is this idea that energy flows through systems nutrient cycle. You can think of water as also cycling. So that's one of the main tenets that I want you to walk away with. Energy flows through nutrient cycle. We eventually, all of the energy of the sun that hits the planet, ultimately gets converted to heat and then goes back <coughs> into space. 
So the role of between our plants and our animals, or our decomposers, the nutrients here are cycling, the energy is falling through. Okay, so these are, I have three last slides for this talk, and I want to talk, just show you the carbon cycle and the nutrient cycle, so this idea of the nutrient cycle, and then I have the hydrological cycle. So in the carbon cycle, we have quite a bit of, of carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere, that's one of the pools of carbon. Um, we have we have contributions to the atmosphere. A lot of the carbon on the planet is locked up in plants. So you can think of that as being one of the pools of carbon on our planet. But the largest pool is the reservoir. So most all of the carbon on Earth is stored down in the lithosphere. So most all of the carbon that we have, the largest reservoir is actually below ground for carbon. We have quite a bit on the surface. We have quite a bit of CO2 in the atmosphere. There can be carbonates in all of the biomass in the ocean. But most of our carbon is, is locked up below ground. So the lithosphere is the, what is the lithosphere, I guess? It's is a, it the, uh, everything above the crust. Above the crust, yeah. but below ground. Okay. Yes. Good question. So this is the carbon cycle. But it does cycle. Because carbon dioxide in the atmosphere gets locked back into the biomass. Biomass can be decomposed or buried put back down into the lithosphere. CO2 can be absorbed by the ocean and ultimately settle back down into the lithosphere. So it's a cycle. So it's the carbon cycle. Most of it's below ground. Nitrogen, though, is different. The nitrogen cycle, anyone want to speculate on where the reservoir pool of nitrogen is? Where's most of the nitrogen on the planet? Here, we're breathing it. Most all of the nitrogen on the planet basically exists in the atmosphere. So roughly 80% of, of our atmosphere is nitrogen. This is the sick irony for plants. Plants so desperately need nitrogen, and they're swimming in an ocean of it, and they can't use it. So, uh, you know, nitrogen is, or the reservoir pool for nitrogen is, is up here in the atmosphere. So it becomes made available through plants, through uh, processes which make, they may turn atmospheric nitrogen into a, a, in a, a, a form that can be readily taken up by plants, and those forms tend to be nitrate and, uh, and ammonia. Some plants use ammonia, and some plants can use some plants can use amino acids, but not many. But then plants can take nitrogen back up, incorporate it into their biomass, <coughs> and they go through trophic levels. Okay, so that's basically the nitrogen cycle. But again, this is a cycle going from the pool in the atmosphere to below ground uh, components being incorporated into living organisms, and then back up into the atmosphere. So the soil, you can think of that as. Uh, I have a question here, but so I'll go to the last slide. Hydrological cycle. Most all of my work deals with the water cycle. So the hydrological cycle, you can think of the same thing. You have uh, you have water in the form of vapor in the atmosphere. Most of the water, though, is stored in the oceans, of course. And then you can have all of the different ways in which water cycles through precipitation, through runoff, through infiltration, and then ultimately recycle. But in this case, the reservoir pool for water are the oceans. Okay. 